Hello and welcome back to the Digital Marketing Podcast. My name is Kieran Rogers. I'm Louise Crossley. And I'm Daniel Rolls. And today we are discussing the latest trends. So before we get into the main podcast episode, we've actually got a gold pass giveaway and a 20% discount for everyone else to the Revenue Marketing Summit in London. The summit returns this November for those of you that want to learn the latest marketing strategies. Just go to targetinternet.com forward slash podcast to get the discount or to enter the draw. Good luck. Hello, Caitlin here, event producer of Revenue Marketing Alliance, and I'd like to invite you to attend Revenue Marketing Summit London on November the 29th and 30th. Join us to stay on top of trends, learn how to drive consistent growth, network with like-minded marketers, hear from the likes of Pinterest, Uber, to name a few. See you in London. So we haven't done a latest trends episode in a little while, and there's there's constantly stuff happening at the moment. We could do one of these every week. <laughs> it's it? always late, latest trends. Yeah, exactly. There's, it just kind of keeps moving, but it's been a pretty bonkers. Mm. Okay, so we've got things like which we'll come to later on. Uh, Twitter's not called Twitter anymore. I mean, a little bit of a seismic shift there as well. It's now called X. We'll talk about that. Uh, we've had the launch of Threads, which is Facebook's Twitter. Is it Facebook's X? now i don't know okay anyway instagram uh, yeah yeah i don't know matters is who knows Matters. Right? don't call them Facebook. now let's do, all right well okay so let's let's talk about this a very good point uh let's start there so meta here's an idea why doesn't every major platform just change its name randomly it's, just it's, to keep kieran on his toes yeah and also just to mean that our, our e-learning has to be constantly oh. updated it's such a headache so meta change the name to meta from facebook <laughs> to, to focus on the metaverse seem to have regretted their life choices a little bit because they're very, very focused on AI now all of a sudden because everyone else is focused on AI. I don't know if that, I think in the long term it might have been a good move, but we'll see. harsh. Do you think it's like, harsh? Yeah, yeah. I can't, I, like... The, the story I always tell is that you go, right, so we can both put on our thousand pound headsets yeah. and then we can meet each other in the yeah. metaverse as cartoon characters of ourselves. Yeah. You yeah. go, oh, we could do a Zoom call. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> right? But I, I see where they're going. There's a video I keep playing, which is their avatar they've generated right mm-hmm. so you just scan your face brilliant video and then it generates this avatar of you and it looks like you can't even tell it's an avatar pretty much um i think their bet on the metaverse was a good one but it was an early one mm. so we'll see where that kind of moves to their bet on social media was fairly early yeah that's fair. that paid off for them yeah that's that's true so what they've done though is they've just released llama 2 to explain <laughs> what this is llama 2 is a large language model just like chat gpt and bard which is which is Google's but content. more cuddly sounding. Well, well yeah, it does sound, <laughs> like Lama does sound more cuddly, isn't it? Um, the interesting thing is they they've just run some tests with it against ChatGPT, yeah. and they published the data, and we'll put it into the show notes. But what they're basically saying is, on pretty much every measure, it performs better than ChatGPT. Uh, the key thing they're really focused on is what they're referring to as safety, and what they mean by that is that it's not basically telling you lies, and it's doing a lot more citations and telling you where it got the data from and things like that. So ChatGPT, which I'll talk about in a moment as well, is very prone to hallucinations, i.e. telling you things that aren't true, making up statements. Um, we were one of the professors at Imperial College. We we, we asked ChatGPT what he did and it went, oh, he's a professor of marketing. And it's like, oh, okay, great. Told the right things. And he's a rocket scientist. And it's like, he's not a rocket scientist. And he's been to the moon. And it's like, <laughs> Wait a minute. I don't think this is true. So yeah, there's a bit of a problem with that. I'm sure they are trying to improve ChatGPT on that basis. But Llama 2 is going to be a lot safer, they, they say at the moment. What's really interesting, though, is Microsoft have made a $10 billion investment in ChatGPT. But with their API, their program interface, you can use ChatGPT, but you've also got the option of using Llama 2. So they're basically building a relationship between Meta and Microsoft, which I think is really interesting. I think they've always had a very strong relationship. So for years, there was always this synergy between like content that had got a lot of social reactions on Facebook and content that ranked on Bing. Okay, fine. That's an interesting observation. So, So I think it's kind of clever that Microsoft are positioning themselves as the place you go to to help integrate with these tools. Because you think, oh, if I've got Microsoft Office or Teams, well, if I can use ChatGPT or I can use Llama, I've got some choices. So they're not trying to kind of have that monopoly position on and it. They, and they've, they've been really like focused on keeping everything open, haven't they? Yeah, like, well, that, this is where they got bitten before, right? Because the whole browser war thing. So if you go back and look at it, Internet Explorer, 
it was automatically your default kind of browser and they got they got fined a huge amount of money and there's a big mistrust case over it um and actually some would suggest that for a period of time it stopped them innovating as much mm. but actually they've they've moved on with that and they've really started to innovate what well, I, I saw them at a conference it was the ceo uh and she was absolutely brilliant and everyone said well you know google's a cool company is microsoft not a cool company and she went no we're not trying to be cool we're trying to make our clients look cool mm. So I thought, oh, okay, it's quite nice. And it's like the, the enablement kind of tool. you do for well. your customers. Yeah. What a great. So that was nice. Yeah. So they're doing that anyway. So I thought it's worth kind of taking a look mm. at that as well. All right, let, let's move on to the elephant in the room that is Twitter becoming X. I didn't even know this had happened no, no, this until was this morning funny. when you're like, well, I'm he, he like, looked, wait, what? He looked at me like I was lying when I did yeah. it as well. Like, are you making this up? The thing uh, is as well, with rebranding something already so well established, oh. Kieran can't remember that Google Ads is now Google AdWords is now Google Ads. I know, it's no hope that I'm going to remember Twitter is now X. People will always still call it Twitter. Well, Channel 4 have got brilliant. They actually commented online. So Channel 4 in the UK, television channel, and they had mm. their app was 4OD, 4 On Demand. Yeah. And they rebranded it to, I don't know, I, and I don't actually know what the rebrand is called, but I still call it 4 On Demand. You still call Google Ads, Google AdWords. Yeah. Uh, and there are a number of things that are kind of like that. Twitter. I still call Prince, Prince. There you go. The artist <laughs> formerly known as. Okay. Um, so this is, this is the kind of problem with this. So from a, every branding agency in the world has gone, what on earth? Like you're supposed to think through a rebrand, not just kind of do it overnight. And I'm sure there was thinking behind it. I think... I can see the logic from the point of view of like we're building something new. It can't just be seen as a microblogging surface. Therefore, we need to call it something new. But then all the memes started, right? So it's now called X. So if you're not tweeting anymore. And you know, what, you're Zeting? Uh, it's spelled X-E-E-T. Mm -hmm. And people were coming up with all these different names for different things and so on as well. There were fake things going out saying, oh, they've changed it in the uh, in the forums and in the help documentation that's now called Zeting. And it like it went, it went basically viral on X Twitter, uh, so on as well. I'm gonna sit and wait a little bit and watch the dust settle around this one to see if people can kind of cope with it. My thing is, there's so much change going on anyway. People are a bit, you know, nervous about they may be using Twitter, and certainly on advertising, their advertising sales have dropped fairly significantly. But then, Meta launched Threads, which is basically their Twitter. Mm. Right. So, and I was like, will people be bothered? to use yet another platform. I get you, you guys' opinion on this because my feeling was all the digital marketing community and influencers all jumped on threads, get their account set up and really easy because because your Instagram was automatically then set you up an account on Which threads. It's a genius move. It took away a lot of the friction, yeah. right? So that was quite clever. And they went, oh, we've got, you know, uh, was it 100 million registered users really quickly, mm. whatever the number was. Um, but will they keep it up? Because one, if I'm posting to... Facebook and to Instagram and to LinkedIn and and to, and to, and to, and to. it just kind of the list goes on and on, and unless there is a critical mass of people there and the people that are on Twitter, although everyone's been going, oh, I'm not, I don't like Twitter because Elon Musk owns it, no one really seems to have moved away from it particularly. There's not a huge amount they, of people. They, they, if you have an audience, you're too invested in it. Yeah, right. To move away from that audience, and I've seen some quite a lot of hypocrisy with this as well. Going, oh, I don't like it. I'm standing against this kind of thing. Yeah. Oh no, I'm not because my audience is here. Yeah. So. Um, is and it, also, it forces that point of, oh, shoot, I don't own my audience. Right. So, <laughs> the yeah. platform does. Yeah. And I think it doesn't matter how much I don't like the platform. I, I'm, I'm hooked. I'm a junkie. Well, the, the culture wars are playing out here a little bit, which we won't get into as well. Of, you know, people, the politics coming into it, all that kind of yeah. stuff as well. I mean, what I would say is threads is quite nicely done. I quite like the interface, all that kind of stuff as well. I can't be bothered to use yet another platform. She's saying quite a lot for someone that's, you know, all day, every day talking about this stuff and doing this stuff. So first of all, if I can't be bothered, is my average customer going to? They're marketing people, so maybe, but I'm, I'm not sure. It might have got a load of registered users, but I'm not sure they're going to stick with it. So I feel like when Threads or originally launched, loads of brands sort of drifted towards it and post on it because they didn't want to seem like they weren't keeping up with it. Yeah. Well, there's also this first lead advantage. Like, yeah. Oh, if you're not on TikTok early, you're not going to get established. So everyone's like, oh, right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to land grab. But still, is it going to get traction? I do wonder whether it will be sort of a hype thing and the novelty will wear off. Quite right. With apps sort of like Be Real, there's new apps and people get really obsessed with them and then they don't pick up as much. Um, there's some differences with threads and Twitter that are quite sort of detrimental. So you can't use hashtags or search on threads which for discoverability 
is interesting. Massive problem, right? Um, so you can search for other users, but you can't search for topics or any sort of discussions. Um, there's also no private message or DM feature at the moment. So in terms of engaging with customers and customer support from that angle, and it also doesn't support paid ads at the moment. But but look at how well it's doing and look at the reports coming through where brands are saying getting much better levels of engagement on threads. Yeah, than, and it will really all surprised. be. And it's, and it's been sustained over the last few. We're only a few weeks into the journey, right? So Yeah, I guess that's And it will all be for. organic because they don't but support paid ads. My, right my view on that this. That will change as well, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah, my view on this is look at how well it's doing without all of these features. And they are definitely actively like developing this in the background. I, I think it's going to become a, a force to be reckoned with. And I think one of the things a lot of users have picked up initially, and I hope it stays like this, is it's just got a much friendlier vibe. Yeah. And that's, yeah, that's, and that's a good. that's a great point, actually, that because is Twitter is toxic a lot. Oh, of it's, right? it can be really, I mean, I still love good. Twitter. I'm yeah. still a big fan of Twitter. And uh, in a way, I would kind of argue that some of those, like the fact that it doesn't support the hashtags and it's not as easy to search. Do you know what? That helps keep it more real. Mm. Because as soon as you yeah, have features like know. that, the bots just move in and, and, and kill it. And, and with those bots comes... Large numbers of them being controlled by a few very clever puppeteers. Yeah, right. Um, and and I think personally, I think that's one of the things that's made Twitter such a toxic environment is is that influence because it's too easy to do. It's too easy to game it and pull all the strings on a million accounts when you're really just one person. What's it's in? also just worth noting before you download it, it's so connected to your Instagram that if you change your mind, so there's a little Threads icon that appears on your profile, but if you change your mind, you can't delete your Threads account without deleting your whole Instagram account. Mm -hmm. So that's worth noting. Um, and they also actually launched in 2019. Speaking as an Instagram Yeah, that's app. interesting. But it was sort of more... Just, um, just repeat that for us there. So was, they, what, what was that? I missed that. Threads launched as an Instagram app um, in 2019, but it was sort of more uh, similar to Snapchat. So it was a lot more image-based and sending uh, images, images to different right, users. Okay, yeah. um, but that got discontinued in 2021 because it didn't really pick up. So this is their second go at it. So it'll be sort of interesting to how it yeah. pans yeah, out. Yeah, I, I'm, I think we're getting into an era of increasing fragmentation in social media. Mm -hmm. And Seth Godin was talking about this. He was saying, right, the, the succession of the TV show, you know, 3 million people watched it. Well, it used to be your average TV show would get 15 times that viewing, okay? Because everyone watched the same channels. And the point you make was like, and now they don't. So the point being is that like, we all used to be on Facebook. Everyone had a Facebook account. Well, they don't anymore. And you're going to find, you know, different groups of people are using different platforms in places that kind of suit them. So increasingly, rather than trying to be on every single social platform, we need to work out which ones are working for us. And I mean, the reality for us, if I look at all the social platforms, do you know what works? It's not, it's not rocket science, it's LinkedIn. Because we are a B2B organization that's talking to marketers and communications people and small business owners. So that works. And rather than diluting what you're doing and trying to be on every channel, maybe focusing on just the ones that are key to you. And also that whole thing of like, you can't be good at everything. You spread yourself too thin. So focus on being in certain areas, but experiment as well. Don't just go, well, we're not doing threads. We need to go in and try it out and test it and then go, is it working? Is it not working for us as well? So there's like, no variables you need to test. It's like when TikTok came out and everyone was saying, oh, we need to be on TikTok. We need to be in TikTok. Yeah. But it's actually better to not be on the platform than to be on it, but Very not badly. really sure what you're doing. Yeah, 100%. 100%. I, I think it's interesting that they are planning and it doesn't do it yet but they are planning on making threads compatible with activity pub which is like this open oh, standard fine. for making networks interoperable so yeah. it would enable the protocol to sort of integrate with things like mastodon and wordpress and allow all sorts of different connections so in terms of that and that's that's an unusual play from what i've seen before from meta where they tend you know always before they've built very walled gardens this is a much more no, they, open... They've been open speaking about this for a while, actually, because yeah. they were saying, you might use Instagram for direct messaging. I might use WhatsApp. Uh, you might be on Messenger. Mm. And it doesn't matter. I can send from Messenger to you, and it'll arrive in your WhatsApp or it'll arrive in wherever. So they are, they're kind of talking about that as well. They have, because of the stuff that happened with Data Analytica, and there was this big distrust thing towards Facebook, I genuinely think that Mark Zuckerberg is trying to address that and has been for a while, right? And... The whole thing about Llama being safer and being more reliable and trying to make things more open. I think there's some lessons being learned and they're trying to do So it's a real kind of shift. Um, but oh, we should throw the door open. Meta, come talk to us. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Do an interview. Love to have you on the podcast. Yeah, set, 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 set something up. We'd love, I'd love to get their perspective 
on this and their roadmap and where they're, they're looking to take it. I think it'd be really exactly. good. Exactly. So um, let's go to the YouTube, right, legal disclaimer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is an opinion. This is some stuff we've read. This is not necessarily factually accurate, but I'm going to discuss it and talk about it, right? So this is the YouTube ad scandal. And what's, we'll link to it in the show notes where this comes from. The YouTube ad scandal. Yes. Oh. Yeah, right. So what they're basically saying is that they looked at some major brands and their ad spend on true view skippable ads, so the ads that you can kind of skip, um, they looked at it and said more than 50% of their ads weren't showing up on Google websites. They were showing up on GVP, so Google Video Partner websites, kind of like the Google Display Network for video ads. Uh, and they were saying that they were serving these ads uh, in outstream, so not at the first bit of the video. It was happening kind of at the end of it and so on like that. They were muted in some cases, so you couldn't actually hear the audio. Mm. Uh, they were auto-playing, so it was just playing one after the other after the other. Mm. They were playing um, without any actual content, organic content, just the ad after ad after ad, mm. interstitials uh, in non-visible ad slots that were down the page. The bottom line, what they were saying, is that loads of these ad partner websites were just showing ad after ad after ad to make revenue but people weren't really seeing the ads or they weren't in a place where they could engage with them and so on as well. As I've said, this you know we need to look into the truth of this. We need to find out what the facts are behind it. I'll link to the data and so on. It, kind of in Google and YouTube's defense, yep. if people abuse your network and do nefarious things like that, that's, yep. that's quite hard to police at the kind of scale that they're dealing with. But I guess... Well, they're making yeah. money out of it, so it is their well, job to police it. Yeah, I guess so. But I could see how things like that could catch you unaware so now oh, we don't know the true scale of this like no. it, i could guarantee i could go onto any network now and i, I could find dodgy, abuses yeah, 100%. Of it. you know this is so it's in a way i kind of feel for them because it's kind of a bit harsh but because they're the big player they're easy to of course not cry yeah. everyone wants to like know about that what i would also say as well is i think this is more the truth of this or not it's more indicative of we've been kind of getting stats believing them assuming they're true and we don't want to dig much deeper, right? Mm. So if I get a thing from Facebook or from Google or from anyone else that says your video had this many views, I'm kind of like, right, yeah. I had that many views. Give me a graph that does that. Yeah, yeah, it's that's it. Right. And, and it's <laughs> kind of like we've been quite happy to ignore the reality of actually what's happened afterwards, how much of an impact has it had and all that kind of stuff as well. So I think where this article went and where a few others have gone on this as well is saying, well, first of all, have we been missold? Like, are we paying for stuff that's we've been, you know, they're saying maybe in this particular case, Google turned a blind eye to it to some extent as well. Um, whether that's true or not, we don't know. But as an industry, I think we've been happy to turn a blind eye because we report to people, yeah. we've got graphs to show people, we do mo monthly marketing meetings, whatever. And if the data supports us doing a good job, but then we want to share it, right? Particularly if it's a branding campaign. We all right. love a big number, don't we? Oh, we got this thing. Because it's very difficult to prove that it led to actual any business. Yeah. Like, oh, look at how many views we got. And this is, and we've increased it by 30% year on year. I, I think everybody needs to wake up to this. Everybody needs to be taking a check. Like, we mm. need to quality control our, our campaigns. And it doesn't, you know, I used to do this when I was back at, at Lizelle. I wasn't allowed to put any advert on any website unless I'd personally gone and approved that website. Now, that made, getting things to scale really hard. Right. But literally, you look at your, any of your, the, the reports are there. And you can go through you know, where your ad was shown and you will see, gosh, look at all these hairy Herberts that we would not want to touch with a barge pole. Yeah, like they will exist. And it's not, in a way, I think it's it's kind of like a little bit like kind of, but ma'am, it's not fair. It's kind of like that, isn't it? It's like, look, guys, we're all, we're all adults here. That's how we know how the world works. We know how networks work. We should be auditing our own stuff and we we, we should have some processes in place, I think, I couldn't to agree check more, the quality. But I would also suggest that... Especially with AI, because it's going to be making decisions on our behalf. Yeah, that's a very good point, actually, that where the ads are being placed. Yeah. So what I would always say is there's two things going on here. There's an industry-wide thing of like, we need to look at quality check our stuff more. But there's also a thing of, if I'm, if I'm making billions and billions of dollars by selling ad space, yeah. which is what a lot of the platforms do, there should be a much bigger focus on what quality you're kind of getting from that as well. But at this scale, the things are going to slip sometimes mm -hmm. as well. So worth looking into. We'll do a bit more reading on it. Have a, have a look at what you think as well. Um, I thought it was pretty interesting. The, the thing I wanted to kind of come to was we've been talking about generative AI for a little bit, right? So you've got ChatGPT, you've got Microsoft Bard. 
we've been running these and kind of using the real world. Um, and um, I've been working with an amazing communications agency called Greenhouse. Greenhouse basically specialize in um, stuff that is about the uh, environment crisis. It's all about you know reducing carbon footprint, stuff that's impacting the environment in various different ways. Um, they've done work with Google and, and loads of other kind of big brands. They're a really lovely, lovely group of people. They've got offices in London and in Bristol, um, and we're actually going to get them on the podcast very soon, and I'll explain why. So what they've done is say, as an agency, everyone's got the offices in London, but the fact that they're in Bristol as well. You like that? I do. I just feel, and I'm, I'm going to upset a lot of people, I just feel Bristol's cooler. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> cooler than London. That's kind of like, you're, you're, you're going to upset is. some Londoners now. Do, 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 if you're upset by that, go to Bristol. <laughs> Just go to Bristol. You'll see what I mean. You'll feel it, it when you get nice, there. It is a nice place. Yeah. It is very cool. Um, they basically have gone through and said, like, as an agency, how should we use these tools? How shouldn't we be using these tools? So they've had some really, really good conversations. Um, they have created a charter and we will link through, link through to it. But they've got a charter that says, this is what we will do. This is what we won't do. They're having the conversations with their teams. I think this is really, really a great example of what as organizations we should be doing. Um, but they've also been doing some testing and we ran a load of testing. And basically the outcome is that um, Bard at the moment seems to be better at citations and safety from the point of view of, it will tell you where it's got stuff from, um, it will go through and give you more, it won't go off and do those kind of, those hallucinations and do really random stuff as much as ChatGPT will. But ChatGPT is better at creating content is what we've kind of found at the moment, kind of playing around with the tools. So there is, and that's going to shift and change, obviously, and we've got Llama coming into the mix um, from Meta and so on as well. Um, what was interesting when we were testing this out, you like it, Lama, yeah, Llama, I don't I, you? I'm desperate to know what sound does a Llama make? Well, you, you just, just feel like ask. making that sound every time it's mentioned. Okay, we're going to find out. <laughs> I mean, we might, might even edit, edit that into they, the video afterwards. Did they go moo? Did they go woof? Oh. What, what, what sounds do like? Have any ever seen them in a field? Well, Lama seem quite quiet. A spit as well. So, yeah, this <laughs> might not be a nice noise. You might regret <laughs> what you're asking for here as well. Careful what you're asking for, Kieran. Um, so, completely <laughs> lost track of thought there. But, yeah, it's, it's interesting to see what they're good at and what they're not good at. And that will yeah. change over a period of time. But this is the point, is that there, at the moment we keep talking about chat GPT, there will be multiple AIs. Mm. There will be loads of different AIs that are good at different things. And some will be good at writing emails and some will be good at, you know, doing graphics and some will be good at social posts. Llama could be really great at spitting out content. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Nice, nice. <laughs> I, I can That's see this one. is going to go around now. <laughs> um, so it, it's kind of interesting. We need to be playing around these. But what I love that Greenhouse did was this charter. Yes. Was this whole piece about... Um, what we will and won't do and having clarity on that as an organization and having our ethical guidance and all those kind of things around it as well. Also, that's the other thing that kind of obviously came up with their conversation was that they're focusing on these kind of issues. The reality is using these tools can generate carbon, right? Because it's quite a lot of processing mm -hmm. power involved. So looking at the companies running it and going, how do they offset their carbon? How does that work? And actually, Microsoft and Google have done a huge amount of work. You know, they've offset the carbon back to the beginning of the company and beyond and so on. So we're kind of taking a look at. But one, be careful if you're using these tools because they get things wrong a lot. Things like write me five uh, bullet points on this and it will give you four or six. And it's like, no, I want five. And it still won't. So they do some strange things. They'll make things up. They'll get things wrong. So really, you need to know about the subject to use them effectively. Mm. So that expertise becomes really important still. Um, thank well. goodness yeah that's it right because otherwise well a very different world we'd be heading into if they were perfect yeah and they, they are going to get better as well mm. so it's going to be interesting what i have seen though and we're going to look into this is people generating websites full of ai generated content and ranking well which is what you kind of surprised at a little bit i guess if it provides value to the target audience's definitions and stuff like that maybe it works but it feels like we're back like we were 15 years ago maybe 10 years ago where people are just scraping, putting it onto their own website, generating spam websites. So I guess that's going to happen for a while. But yeah, have, have a look at it. And uh, we'll link through to all this stuff in the show notes. Before we move on, can we just give that lovely QR code visual tool a bit of a plug? Because I, I was blown away by that. So this is something Daniel plucked out of thin air. It was, it was it, casually this it morning. Was, I'm like, holy moly, that's sound amazing. engineer that did it. I was just trying to bring it up was, on the screen yeah. here as well. Um, QRBTF.com. Okay. Uh, basically, it allows you to put generate QR codes using Midjourney, the AI tool. Uh, but it does these beautiful images that are scannable. 
it's quite mind-boggling. I mean, like how beautiful the QR really codes clever. are. Really nice. Really, really So take clever. a look at it. We'll put that into the show notes um, as well. So there's some new things for you to be thinking about, some new tools to play around with, some websites, that kind of thing. We want to hear your opinions. I'm really interested in what you think about Twitter becoming X and if you're using threads or not. Those are the two things. So please do get in contact. And, and we do reply to everything. So just get in contact with the website. And obviously, is Bristol cooler? Yeah, it's Bristol cooler <laughs> than London. Controversial. Uh, and important. see what you think about that as well. Or is there somewhere else that's even better as yeah. well? Probably, you know, there are towns outside the, the UK taunting. as well. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. Well, thank you for listening, everyone. We'll see you again on the Digital Marketing Podcast. Please subscribe for more videos like this and visit targetinternet.com for more free digital marketing resources.